morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the second Middle East IPP6 webinar, IPP6 Plus webinar. My name is Tony Eid. I'm the founder of Telecom Review Group and CEO of Trace Media, and will be the moderator of today's webinar. Following last year's success and the positive impact that the first edition had, this year's edition entitled IPP6 Enhanced Innovation paved the way for digital transformation in the Gulf region. We'll focus on national digital development and digital transformation in the Middle East and Gulf region, and will allow industry experts to share their business experience. This year, we have an impressive lineup of speakers who will share each from their own perspective and field of expertise and the importance of the IBV6 and IBV6 Plus trends. Our speakers today are Samir Malik, Senior Principal Analyst, OMDF, Robin Lee, IETF, IAB member, Dr. Bilal Jamusi, Chief of Study Groups Department, ITU Standardization Bureau, Salma Slaty, Head of Standards and Next Generation Technology, the Communications Regulatory Authority, CRA of Qatar. Adib Brady, General Manager for Internet Services Development, CITC, KSA. Sultan Muhammad Sabhan, Zain Technology Core General Manager. Jamal Sahyoun, Vice President, Enterprise Architectures and Transformation of Itzalat. Latif Adid, Founder and President of IBV6 Forum and the Chair of ETSI ISG IPE. We will wrap the webinar with a poll that we invite all of you to take part in it, and then we'll have a Q&A session. So please keep your question until the end. I will take all the questions as much as the time will allow us. Now, let's kick off the webinar with our first speaker, Samir Asfak Malik, Senior Principal Analyst on DIA, who will discuss advancing the digital economy with IBV6 and IBV6 Plus. Samir, uh, it's yours now. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, Salaam alaikum and good afternoon to everyone staying in Middle East. Uh, as already mentioned by Tony, uh, my name is Samir and I'm based in Sydney, Australia. Uh, very happy and, and very privileged to join this webinar uh, regarding the IPv6 and IPv6 Plus. And I'm also representing Omdia as one of the intelligence and the marketing research company for the technology and their thoughts and their research uh, findings for the IPv6 and IPv6 plus uh, deployments, uh, market status, market traction, adoption, and what is actually going on. And what are the basic compelling reasons for uh, doing the IPv6 and IPv6 plus? Uh, but this is all about my, my quick session uh, at, in the start. And I'm covering like uh, nine to 10 pages in the slides and happy to answer your questions at the end of the session, if you have any. So number one is about the success of digital economy. Uh, we, already, we already know that uh, economies are moving towards a digitalization. So digital economy is one of the driver uh, for, for boosting the GDP in all over the world. So for having a digital economy, what is actually the most important thing we found in our uh, analysis is about the connectivity. And it's not about the connectivity, I can say that is a full end-to-end -end connectivity for all uh, the automation, factory automation, manufacturing plants, and everything that contribute to the economy. And as per one of the statistics for the United Nations, that mentions uh, the GDP contribution in the, for the digital economy is around four trillion to thirteen point six trillion dollars in twenty nineteen. So that's that's a very big amount. And you can imagine what is the role for digital economy in in boosting the GDP, and then where the connectivity stands in. Uh, though I know the Middle East is, is uh, I mean, staying very uh, in, in the front in connectivity because they have big fiber resources and their technology is very high, but still other parts of the world is lacking the full connectivity. They're still believing, uh, they are not believing, but they are still depending on the copper network. So that's, that's one of the statistics. Second is as the 5G is already there, uh, people talking about 5G many years before is about the mobile broadband and then the video services, but the real value for the 5G is B2B applications. How we can use the 5G to monetize our B2B application. That is the basic, and I can see that the driver for the 5G implementation. So considering all this 5G IoT and connectivity, uh, what are the things what we found in the research is the global IoT devices is 
actually increased from 2019 to 2024 to 25 million uh, 441. That's that's a big number for the global IoT devices. So when we have that much of IoT devices, including uh, non-industrial and industrial, that having a compound annual growth rate for 14.3 percent. So you can imagine what is the status for IP. Can we still alive with IPv4, where the address space is already depleting? Uh, there is no more address spaces more. And we already know that the 7 billion population in the world, uh, we only uh, restricted with three or 4 billion IP addresses. So how we can cater the rest 3 billion people of the, of the world. So, and when they, everybody needs IPNN is the era of the smartphone. So that's overall uh, statistics for the IOT after the 5G and then the connectivity that needs. So the digital economy is heavily depending on the connectivity. That's a key message over here. Second about, I just put a couple of good, uh, I can say that the application that because people talk about connectivity, but they don't know what actually the connectivity brings for them. So these are the applications, B2B applications, especially in the industrial automation, I can mention again, that need a connectivity. You can talk about in Germany, we are the industrial 4.0. I mean, we call it the next generation industrial automation or revolution is already happening. Now they all need connectivity on the 5G where they want to connect their devices. They want to connect their robots. Uh, we already heard about the uh, smart city a long time ago, but now this moving from smart city to tactile internet, or we call it haptic internet. We talk about smart logistics. In China, we are very much talking about, and we are seeing there is a lot of development for the uh, COVID war. During the COVID war, there is a smart 5G hospitals and the 5G ambulances. So these are the applications there's a purpose to share here from the OMDIA's uh, bench that cross digital applications in the economy that need connectivity. And that is a driving force for the 5G standalone architecture. And when we talk about 5G standalone architecture, this is all we talk about the IP. If I talk about in Australia, I just mentioned one here, picture over here for the smart agriculture. As yes, Australia is a purely agriculture country, you can see that they need uh, they need a lot of IP things and um, IP devices to connect, especially in the in the neck of the cow. They need a sim that to mention. Okay, this cow is moving in the farm. Similarly for the plants. So these are the things that industry needed at the moment. And then after me, my, most of the speakers they talk about in more detail about uh, their their domain that how they can use that applications for the IP connectivity. Now one of the another statistics uh, we done is about. Uh, I can just move it here, that the global state of IPv IPv6 adoption. For the IPv6 adoption, 40 to 45 uh, percent, I mean, we can say that a country are going very fast for the adoption, like India, Malaysia, Belgium in Europe, Saudi Arabia, UAE in Middle East. I mean, these are the countries that are going very fast adoption for IPv6, I can say even IPv6 plus, uh, because of the, some other technical, uh, technical uh, protocol like SRV6, I'm talking later on the slide. Uh, but 70 to 73 percent of the population of the countries still only have a 10 percent of penetration in the world for the ipv6 though they know the the value of ipv6 but they're still waiting on the network address translation or netting to translate the private into the to the public ip addresses and they believe that this is just a matter of moving from ipv4 to ipv6 uh, and then you can imagine that ipv6 started back in 1998 then 2012 and now in 2017, it got a complete RFC. So in 2019, everybody talked about IPv6. So it's not a new concept industry. The only purpose and the only problem we have seen from the research point of view that the market adoption of IPv6 in the last decade was not that fast. And that, that's the reason I put some uh, world graph over here. Second, what are the reasons of acceleration to IPv6? Now, I, I know that many technical people sitting here from a technology point of view, for sure, uh, 5G and IoT are the biggest driver uh, for adopting IPv6 and then enhanced version of IPv6 that is called IPv6 plus. And then when we talk about 5G, I'm not interested in 5G that talks about mobile broadband only because 4G is good enough to do it. It's only the matter of speed. But why 5G is getting more, more famous, why operators moving towards the standalone architecture as my understanding and my experience in the industry, is again B2B or the enterprise digitalization that includes the cloud. And then we talk about verticals that are actually the source of revenue for the service providers. I can share over here and you already seen on internet, many countries in Europe, they are moving towards a private 5G networks. Why are people talking about the private 5G networks? 
what is the benefit to the to the service providers if any industry open and private 5G network? What about the future for IP 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 devices? About about the IP addresses? So you can imagine from here that service providers should be ready for for complete end to end adoption of IPv6 in their network. Just going with the dual stack as one of the reason is is a short solution, but is a not long term solution. When service providers and enterprise talk about the segment routing, that's an, another compelling reason that they want to do enhanced version of IPv6 plus end-to-end -end because automation, uh, diagnosis, fault tolerance, they're all very much easy from the SDN controller for managing end-to-end -end network. And then these are, I mean, this is, I cannot say the whole list, but the, some of the characteristics that are good reasons for, for moving towards IPv6. And then on the top of it, of course, the round trip time, the low latency requirement in the 5G, like 10 to 15 milliseconds or 20 to 25 milliseconds are another uh, drivers for, for going towards the end-to-end -end IPv6. And when we talk about IPv6, my message over here, we need to support a native IPv6 in the platform. It's not, not, a, not a dual stack uh, IPv4 with the IPv6, though technically is, is right. I'm not uh, challenging that is technically cannot work, but is only a short-term solution. Now we talk about the IPv6 plus innovation. You already heard for IPv6, but what is IPv6 plus? If you talk, if you can see the ETSI or ITF standards, they're talking a lot. They're they are pushing a lot for the IPv6 plus because of SRV6 segment routing. We talk about MPLS, very, very perfect protocol technology. They can do the, the, the transportation of my voice and video from one end to another end, but why are we moving to a segment routing? Because it's a programmable protocol interface where they only know the destination. They don't need to hop and hop on every, every stop or every junction or every, every, every router, right? So they can know that I can program my instructions from one source router to end router. And when we talk about this programmability nature for segment routing, then SDN sitting at the top becomes very user-friendly to that one. For them to do the fault tolerant, uh, intelligent routing, tunnel setup, network analysis, diagnosis is very much easy. And that's a different that SRV6 brings and then in, adopt in 5G and where we needed IPv6 plus. So these are some of the compelling reasons. And then this is the innovation for IPv6 plus. I know that many people are still reluctant. I mean, I, when I talk about people, the enterprises, they are not going to implement IPv6 plus by, by tomorrow, but at least the IP strategy should be very clear on the service provider level or on the regulator level. That, that's what the finding for the research is. They have to set the path that when and when, I mean, when they're going to deploy deploy IPv6. Uh, it's not a matter of if, it's talking of the matter of when they're going to do it. This is very important now because the address space is very limited. So that's that's one of the top, a quick uh, update for the IPv6 plus. Another for the enhanced innovations, again, coming back to the applications I mentioned in the first slide, the smart factories, smart robots, smart hospitals, smart farming, all of these applications, they are, they are waiting for that native IPv connectivity. Uh, they are no more interested to go for IPv4 where the address is already very, very, I mean, the address space is very limited with 32-bit address. All my four regional RIRs are already have no IPv4 addresses. So when they come and ask for your more IPv4 address, you are, you are no more with that. So what, what is left is, is IPv6, where you have a trillions of or, uh, space available for having uh, for, for, for connecting the more devices. So bringing more capillary network, deterministic quality of services, uh, more higher bandwidth, better automation with using AI enabled SDN, that's what the driver is for using the enhanced innovation for uh, IPv6. Okay, so another, sorry, this one. Another is about the supporting innovation and economic growth through policy. So the question comes in the mind, how we can deploy? What service providers in every country can do it? is actually from the policy making that what regulator, regulators actually help them to implement. If we talk about, the, for example, in Belgium, how we are doing seeing the, the private and public partnerships from the regulator point of view, how they can bring all the uh, industry uh, contributors, including the service providers, institutions, academia, uh, research organization, and how they can convince them uh, to, to go for the IPv6 adoption. So government role is very important here. And that's one of the reasons in this panel today, we have 
uh, some uh, representation from the government as well that they can talk about what they are doing at the policy level in implementing uh, the IPv6 as a native IP strategy for all the service provider and for all the devices, even for all the businesses. So supporting innovation is not from service provider, but from the government level. And you can see in the chart, the US is, is uh, one of, uh, I mean, one of the, I mean, active contributor in deploying the IP enabled in, in Middle East, Saudi Arabia, from the government level, they have, I think, number one in the Middle East now, if, if I'm not wrong, they're deploying uh, IPv6 heavily for the different devices in the industry. And then on parallel, the UAE as well. Uh, we know that the Dubai is already uh, far ahead in, in technology perspective. So how they are uh, doing a lot of innovations in implementing the IPv6 uh, as, as a complete native IP strategy for all the UAE. Uh, similarly, Belgium, you can see China is going very ahead. India is standing, I mean, sitting at the top of all the countries in adopting the IPv6. And they already set their strategy for 2020 for deploying IPv6. So these are some of the statistics uh, I wanted to share here. And then this is uh, the almost the end of my session is about the white paper that Omdia already uh, wrote for IPv6 and enhanced IPv6 version is already free to download for anyone. You can even now uh, scan this QR code uh, for, for free download. And uh, you can read about a detail about the market adoption, traction, technology, the reasons and all that stuff, what I try to present in this session. And I, I, I believe it would be very helpful for you uh, to have the more detailed insights uh, about uh, the IPv and IP, IPv6 and IPv6 plus and why we are pushing IPv6 plus as compared to IPv4. Uh, so you can free download and I already mentioned the link here. Later on, Mr. Tony can also uh, share the link with you guys, all the participants for, for download the white paper. Okay, thank you. But we don't see the slide where you're talking about the QR code. Can you make it sure you... Is now you can see? No, nobody can see. Oh, huh? all There's slides no... you cannot see or only this slide? Only supporting innovation economy. This last slide we are... The... We are seeing but that. my side is okay. I don't know why. Why is not? Now you can see. Yes. Now, no, cannot see it till now. Yes. Now we can see. Okay. Now you can see, right? It's fine. Thank you. Yeah, anyway, you know. anyway, we we can. Uh, you can if you can copy this QR on the Q and A, uh, uh, so people can access it now. Okay. Yeah, you can even you can scan QR code. I can stay for one or two seconds. You can just scan and you can automatically start. That's fine. You can you can put in the Q and A as an answer later or the Q and okay. A. Okay. Anyone can answer. Okay. Okay. So now so now you can see the last slide, the conclusion or not? Yes. Okay. So just few quick conclusion in, in one or two seconds that again, five uh, G and IoT is the biggest driver for digital economy. That what our research is. Second, IPv4 is already depleted. Uh, we are no more hopes for IPv4. So we have to set our IP strategy. I cannot say IPv6 or IPv6 plus, but IP strategy. And then we fo move forward with IPv6 and 6 plus. Uh, governments, especially the regulators, have to strategize the deployment of native IPv6 uh, for future 5G and IoT applications. Of course, 6G is also all on the way. So how much we are ready for that one. And last, IPv6 adoption is you know unescapable for anyone now. There is no more excuse. So that, that's the way forward. So this is, um, I mean, our, all about from my side, uh, though it's very quick, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer after this session and looking forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samir, for the great presentation and insightful uh, uh, numbers. If you can exit your screen, yeah, thank you. Uh, and now we will go to our next, before I go to other uh, next speaker, just for the people who are sending the question already, Please uh, be sure we will answer you before the, after the polling, not now. Okay, we are we will read all the questions, but not now. And now our next speaker is Robin Lee, IETF AIAB member, who will present about the IPv6 plus industry development. Robin, it's yours now. Thank you. Uh, hello, can you see my screen? Hello. Okay. Uh, this is uh, Robin. Uh, I'm the IETF Internet Architect Board member. I will introduce the progress of IPv6 plus standards and the industry. Uh, 
So first, uh, I will introduce a, a brief introduction about the IP evolution. So this is the rule of the IP evolution. Uh, applications drives the IP network architectures. So uh, different from the uh, optical network and wireless network. So that's uh, for IP network, applications drive the change of the uh, IP network uh, uh, architecture. So from here, we can see that uh, uh, the internet application that's based on the IPv4. So later they have the MPRS technologies. So that's the telecom uh, telecommunication network is changed to IP based. So then we can see that the data center network uh, based on the VXLAN uh, was emerged. So now we think that that's a new uh, era of the uh, IP uh, applications. So now that's the 5D and the cloud and the IoT uh, is driving the change of the IP network architecture. IPv6 plus is the uh, solution and the technology can satisfy the new uh, applications. Uh, so this has been introduced. So. Uh, we can see that's the uh, technology evolution. So that's IPv4, MPRS, then now that's the user IPv6 plus. Uh, so, and uh, here this is also is a glass of the uh, evolution of these uh, IP networks. So we can see that's the IPv4 and MPRS and the IPv6. So we can see that for the past 20 years, IP uh, V6 uh, is adopted and uh, deployed slowly in the existing network. So uh, that's the address uh, network, uh, uh, the address space uh, is a possible issue, but uh, it seems the requirement uh, is not an uh, important requirement to drive the deployment of the IPv6. Uh, but now that's, you know, that's the, there's the new, uh, around of the uh, innovation of IPv6. So that's the SRV6 and the network slicing, and also that's the uh, application aware networking technologies based on the IPv6 are emerging. So that's the new services are based on the IPv6 are, uh, are proposed and are being deployed in the existing network. So that's the new services and the new applications based on the IPv6 can be a, another important drive to uh, accelerate the development and the deployment of IPv6. Uh, so in the uh, last year, I uh, summarized uh, uh, the IPv6 plus research and the standard planning. So we think that the technology can be mature step by step. Uh, so that's we uh, divided into the IPv6 technology into three phases. The first phase is the SRV6 basis uh, capability. This including the functionality of the VPN traffic engineering and the fast reroute. So this is the basic uh, capability of the, uh, uh, the SRV6. So then now there's the, there's the phase two of the IPv6 plus. So this is the new network service for the 5D and the cloud. This new network service, including network slicing, SRV6 compression, and also the on pass telemetry, and also this is the BRV6, uh, et cetera. There's uh, uh, all kinds of, a uh, lot of this, the new network service, uh, for 5D and the cloud based on the IPv6. So that's uh, we, the third phase of the IPv6 uh, uh, plus is uh, APN6. That means the application aware IPv6 networking. So this uh, means to uh, integrate the, the application and the network together to facilitate the final granular service deployment in the network. So this is also related with the change of the current network architecture. So this is we uh, uh, put it in the phase three of the IPv6 plus. Uh, so here, this is a standard, uh, standard uh, layout of the IPv6 plus in the IETF. 
So from here, we can see the standards of the SRE6 uh, is very mature. So the uh, very important uh, uh, milestone is that the RFC uh, <clears throat> 8986. So the, uh, this is the SRE6 network uh, programming framework. The RFC has been published. This is a very important step of the SRE6 maturity. So, and we can see that all kinds of the protocol extension has been adopted by the working group. And now that is is very stable and mature. So now that is the <coughs> a hot topic is the standardization of the IPv6 plus uh, 2.0 uh, functionalities. And now that's the network slicing, that's on-pass telemetry, and also SRE6 compression is very popular. There are all kinds of the solutions and the standards are being uh, defined in the IETF. And also there's the uh, uh, <coughs> IPv6 plus phase three AP6 work is being done in the IETF. Uh, so here is the class is the class about these three important work. The first is the uh, network slicing. So that's is can see as uh, this is the VPN enhancement service. That means not the resource isolation at the edge of the network, but also uh, provide the resource isolation in the transport network. Uh, so this is the network slicing. In fact, this is the uh, uh, is the architecture uh, work is uh, include the data plane. There's the uh, technology to implement the resource isolation. And uh, in the data plane, is uh, need the identifier to indicate the resource and also the control plane to advertise the virtual uh, network uh, uh, topology information and also has the managed plane, the uh, south bound interface and the north bound interface for the management purpose. And so here this is all kinds of this the draft. So we can see that's the data plane, control plane, management plane, and also the architecture. So there's all the possible draft. And this is the second important topic is the compression, SRV6 compression. There's the challenge of the SRV6 header. So there's all kinds of the solution of the uh, SRV6 compression. So now there's uh, two important uh, the solution is that uh, you see the solution and uh, one is a generalized SRE6 solution. So here this is a, a simple comparison between the two solutions. Uh, through this uh, uh, comparison, we can see that the uh, GSRE6 has the advantage of no SRH modification, no new address consumption and the new uh, no new root advertisement. So that SRE6 can guarantee the smooth migration of uh, incremental deployment of the SRE6. So that's and so this is the challenge of the SRE6 header issue. So now that's the GSRE6 has this the multi vendors implementation and the interability test. And also, that's the uh, there's also this the field trail. So that's the uh, the China Mobile. This they have this the field trail uh, uh, last uh, November. Okay. Uh, the last one is the important work is the application aware IPv6 networking. So this work is to convey the application information to the network, so that the network can. Uh, implement the fine granularity service based on the application information. So this can improve the value of the network. So this uh, work that is get the recognition of the uh, a lot of operators. So that's now that's uh, this work is going smoothly in the ITF. So now that's we have this set meeting and also that is uh, promoted and just the last Friday. Uh, in the IETF 111 meeting, we have a successful APM BOP meeting. Almost 200 people joined the APM BOP meeting has a widely discussion on the topic. So we think this work will uh, have this the, get the win the widely recognition. Okay, and there are 
also there's this academia work. So this is the paper of the Infocom has been published. As the sales time, there's also this interability test uh, in the uh, Japan, Tokyo. So has this, this is the uh, demo. <clears throat> Okay, and uh, now, uh, so that's there's uh, almost the, the more than 50 IPv6 uh, uh, plus uh, deployment. This deployment uh, accelerated uh, the maturity of the IPv6 plus technologies. So we think there will be more as uh, IPv6 plus innovation and the deployments in the future. Okay, and also this is the last page. So that's we also have the reference so we published the SRV6 book, SRV6 network uh, programming. The English version has been published uh, in July. So that's is available now. At the same time, because there's all kinds of the materials for reference. So there's the IPv6 plus the website for the reference. Okay, that's all my presentation. Thanks all. All right, thank you, Robin. Uh, and now we'll go to uh, our next uh, speaker, Dr. Bilal Jamusi, uh, who will speak that now. Dr. Bilal. Yes. Uh, thank you very yeah, much, uh, Tony, and uh, greetings to all. Very pleased to join you. And uh, I would like also to thank the previous speakers for um, doing an update and introducing uh, IPv6 and IPv6 plus. Um, I'm pleased to join you today to really uh, look at the uh, broader picture from a, a member state perspective in terms of the transition from IPv4 to IPv6, which would be a prerequisite to really uh, looking at IPv6 plus that is bringing uh, additional technologies in 5G, AI, uh, cloud. And as the previous uh, speaker mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the, the advances in the protocol development in, in the ITF um, what we have seen uh, recently is that uh, with COVID-19 pandemic uh, and the move to the digital world, it has become uh, even more uh, important to transition from IPv4 to IPv6. Uh, many countries uh, in Europe and around the world uh, have experienced a series of uh, lockdowns, which have moved the economic and, and social activity to the online space. And this has accelerated the digital transformation. Uh, it has also uh, exacerbated the existing gaps in uh, society and the economy. Uh, and in this context, uh, there is a sharp increase in the use of digital devices, uh, coupled with an increase in demand for broadband traffic. And that has put pressure on the uh, network operators to ensure consistent levels of quality of service through optimized uh, traffic. Um, so the, the IP protocol as has been presented has gone through this evolution from uh, IPv4 to IPv6 and now IPv6 plus uh, as uh, the work is progressing in the ITF. Um, but we still see a huge gap in terms of the address space uh, that member states have and uh, the exhaustion of the IPv4 uh, address space that uh, has accelerated tremendously because of COVID-19 and the move to the digital world. Um, and uh, that is where we are seeing in the ITU uh, a sharp increase in uh, requests from member states in uh, assistance to the, for their transition from IPv4 to IPv6. And hopefully this will pave the way to um, new improvements and enhancements in the IPv6 protocol that will be the natural transition. Uh, as we have seen in the past, uh, when we started with MPLS, it was uh, based on, uh, uh, didn't have the uh, source routing aspect or the traffic engineering, uh, but then we added uh, protocols like uh, constraint-based routing, label distribution protocol and RSVPTE and so on to provide for source routing. Uh, and now we see this transition from IPv6 to IPv6 plus to enhance uh, the deterministic aspect of the connection. Um, add uh, artificial intelligence um, to uh, to better manage and and uh, use IPv6, uh, but the transition from V4 to V6 remains a real uh, challenge and a real priority. 
Um, in many member states, 99.9% of uh, the IP address space is based on IPv4. Um, the exponential increase in connected devices in all countries and regions, however, has generated a need for more efficient use of the IPv4 space, as well as a rapid transition to V6, um, which gives us a huge, a much bigger uh, protocol or address space than uh, the, uh, the IPv4. Um, so enabling that migration from V4 to V6 requires substantial investment uh, in telecom infrastructure. Um, and this is really putting the pressure on the telecom operator and the internet service providers to uh, invest in that transition. Um, and that could be enhanced by uh, policies in uh, by the government to ensure that the procurement and the deployment of new hardware and devices um, is IPv6 ready and it is IPv6 based. Uh, so there is a combination of uh, technology work and policy work to enhance and accelerate the deployment of IPv6 and uh, hopefully enhancements in the IPv6 protocol with IPv6+. Plus. Um, in this scenario, um, COVID-19 has accelerated tremendously this transition process and we see uh, we hosted uh, last year a, um, uh, a seminar on the national workshop, for example, for Montenegro on IPv6 strategies, policies, and implementations, um, where we highlighted a number of steps uh, that uh, need to be uh, taken to uh, transition to help uh, Montenegro in, this, in transition. But that is a, one example that could be used in many other uh, countries. Establishing a national body, an IPv6 task force, is important, which will take the necessary measure, measures uh, to catalyze and trigger the migration from V4 to V6 in a systematic approach. Elaborating an action plan on the migration to IPv6, uh, coordinating the activities, promoting and monitoring the process with well-established roles and uh, mandates among stakeholders. Uh, promoting the advantages of IPv6 protocol and uh, training on the transition techniques, uh, the various entities and the public administration, as well as the private sector, and conducting a survey with the operators regarding their IPv6 transition plan, uh, developing guidelines for IPv6 implementation and their formalization in order uh, to be used in public institutions and beyond, establishing a laboratory. Uh, necessary for all tests and training for the transition to IPv6, uh, training experts that would turn, uh, in turn train other professionals and junior staff uh, in, in this, uh, the techniques to migrate to IPv6, um, setting up pilot projects to uh, document experiences and build knowledge with particular focus on uh, projects for public institutions as drivers in the wider uh, country transition. So uh, these steps are uh, perhaps very useful in catalyzing uh, the move from V4 to V6 and paving the way to embrace enhancements and improvements in the protocol. As the previous speakers uh, mentioned in the three phases of IPv6+, plus, uh, where uh, with countries now uh, looking at deployments of 5G, uh, more use of cloud, uh, more use of AI, uh, this combination uh, paves the way for innovative ways of uh, new uh, applications and solutions that could be uh, deployed. Um, and also what our ex recent experience is with the 5G machine learning is that uh, when you combine um, traditional telecom solutions with AI, uh, there is a tremendous uh, value and interest. Um, and there are new ways of embracing these new technologies. What we have done in the ITU, for instance, is a, a 5G machine learning challenge where we took the uh, standards in developed by study group 13 uh, and worked with the open source community to uh, provide implementation of those uh, standards. And uh, the challenge is really opening the um, uh, work of universities, operators, vendors to uh, not only work on the standard on paper, but to actually do an open source implementation. And I see the combination of IPv6 and AI 
really moving in that same direction. Uh, you, you're taking the basic protocol, enhancing it, uh, but also adding new techniques to it to allow for uh, innovative solutions to uh, the deployment and use of IPv6. And these new ca use cases that we see in many of our focus groups in the ITU, for example, on autonomous and assisted driving, uh, we uh, we see work on uh, uh, low latency applications, um, uh, various applications that uh, go beyond the, the usual and traditional telecom connectivity, where you combine AI with uh, with uh, you know the basic technology of, of telecom. Um, so um, again, I think the in the global context we can no longer rely on IPv4. Uh, many countries are finding themselves in a similar situation of, uh, uh, you know, countries that have exhausted their IPv4 and need to transition quickly uh, and really move to uh, V6. So uh, perhaps, Tony, those are some of the key uh, elements that I wanted to share with you. Um, uh, we cannot uh, underestimate the importance and the urgency of the transition from V4 to V6 and having um, basic instruments in the in the government and in the country uh, in terms of the lab, the capacity building, uh, the policies to adopt uh, IPv6, uh, plus all these new innovative applications that are emerging um, and the transition on, and the growth of, uh, you know, the uh, IPv6 plus uh, building on top of the basic uh, IPv6 technology. Um, so, those are my my um, my, my notes or uh, input to the conversation. Hopefully, um, we'll hear more from the other speakers and uh, help uh, our friends and colleagues in uh, in the uh, in the region uh, to not only transition from V4 to V6, but also start moving into these new apps uh, and solutions based on V6 plus. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bilal, for the importance of. Uh, uh, the figures and the, the position of ITU on this. Uh, many people I received that why no presentation from Dr. Bilal. If anyone would like to have the, all the, the presentation with uh, verbal presentation of Dr. Bilal, you can check telecomreview.com next week. Now our next presentation is entitled IPv6 deployment lessons learned by Salma Sulaiti, head of standards and next generation technology. The Communication Regulatory Authority, CRA of Qatar. Salma, please go ahead. Cheers. Uh, thank you, Tony, and uh, thank you for the esteemed uh, speakers for uh, their uh, their presentations. I couldn't agree more with uh, our esteemed speakers and the, and the keynotes that they have uh, shared with us today. Um, IPv6 adoption is inevitable and uh, will lay a strong foundation. Regulators have uh, a very key role throughout the transition. Uh, moving to our pre presentation for today, I would like uh, first to uh, say good Good morning to everyone joining us um, in this webinar. Before starting, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, all of you for your valuable time um, for joining this webinar and to extend my appreciation for the organizers of this event for their efforts and contribution. Uh, Today I will be I will be talking about the uh, the transition the IPv6 transition journey for the state of Qatar and the lessons learned so far from the regulator point of view. The state of Qatar is one of the countries that have provisioned the importance of IPv6 transition and its network infrastructure. Qatar is a rapidly de developing nation in economic, cultural, and social terms. To support the development and achievement of Qatar National Vision 2030, it requires an advanced ICT infrastructure capable of meeting the demand this generates and also to act as a catalyst for further development and paving the way for emerging technologies and smart solutions to be adopted. We all uh, know uh, that uh, the result growth of demand for IP space can only be satisfied through the transition to IPv6, and thus uh, this was uh, already mentioned by our esteemed speakers. Therefore, CRA as a regulator believed in the past that the quick adoption of IPv6 by uh, Qatar's ICT ecosystem can be achieved by setting the goals and directions required through an IPv6 
six transition strategy uh, published in 20, uh, 2014. Uh, to activate the strategy, we established an IPv6 task force consisting of several uh, dedicated key stakeholders from the government and private sectors. This was very essential to ensure that all the key members are available and connected together to support each other through this journey. This task force was in charge of initiating and coordinating a number of IPv6 related activities and the primary role uh, for this, uh, for uh, the Qatar National IPv6 Task Force was to advocate, educate, and promote IPv6 across the country. By providing the technical leadership, trainings, meetings, and all uh, the necessities to ensure Qatar's ICT ecosystem is ready for the transition to IPv6. To lead and facilitate a very smooth transition of IPv6 across the country, we operated on three main phases. The first phase was to assess the status of IPv6 adoption and to evaluate the means required for the transition uh, across uh, the stakeholders. We then worked on developing a roadmap a realistic roadmap in coordination with the, uh, the key stakeholders based on their readiness, their needs and requirements through the, the journey. Then it was important to uh, go through an awareness uh, phase, which was about providing guidance and supportive information to assist organizations, develop their migration plans and, uh, and set out their uh, action plans for the transition. This consisted of many uh, activities and initiatives uh, initiated by the regulator, in addition to the leading uh, stakeholders such as academic institutions, the, uh, the internet service providers, the service providers, governmental uh, entities, uh, organizations from the banking industry, aviation, oil and gas. The third was the implementation phase uh, and, uh, and gaining the hands-on experience, uh, learning from, uh, from uh, trials and testings and, and trying to get the hands dirty by practicing throughout uh, uh, dedicated testing labs for this transition. The task force members were specifically selected based on their key contribution to a timely transition. It was important to identify the key stakeholders at the beginning and then encourage and promote IPv6 uh, transition and implementation throughout the industries. These key stakeholders were uh, responsible of um, enabling IPv6 starting from their organizations and the organizations they lead. Now, uh, the key requirement for facilitation was ensuring that the technical teams had uh, the expertise, the technical expertise required for this initiative. So we tried to provide technical trainings in coordination with, uh, with the regional and uh, international uh, organizations such that they, are, uh, they have all uh, the requirements and support for the transition. It was also important to promote knowledge sharing across all the industries. As ac academia were the leader in uh, uh, adopting IPv6 across the organizations in Qatar, they were, uh, they were uh, set as a key model such that they encouraged, they shared the, their experience, the lesson learns, and uh, all uh, the activities they have prefer, uh, performed throughout the implementation of dual stack solutions to the other industries. In addition, we really uh, encouraged and recommended partnership and collaboration throughout this process. It was important to support every single industry uh, depending on their progress and status. We have also conducted one-to-one -one consultation by providing as well um, uh, recommendations, consultations, um, advices to support and encourage and promote this project. Now, we know that this is something that is not easy. Challenges were there. Um, uh, however, it was important to investigate, explore these challenges and try to uh, provide suitable solutions that can uh, push uh, stakeholders and the ICT ecosystem in the state of Qatar to move forward. It was a learning by doing approach. 
uh, something that they need to test, uh, to first to study, to test, and to and then to implement and learn from the outcomes of these studies. So uh, we needed to uh, to adopt a plan based on the progress that have been made by the ICT ecosystem. Resistance was there, uh, especially that it's a, it's a change. It's a very tremendous change without uh, within the industries. Um, people needed to have a new mindset, learn new skills and put new plans so that they can uh, ensure a smooth transition to that. Uh, it was important that we convince and we promote and we show the benefit and the advantages of IPv6 throughout this process. Um, in addition, uh, one of the key challenges we have encountered was the, was the uncertainty of vulnerabilities and security threats related to IPv6. Therefore, it was important to provide the awareness about IPv6 security and techniques to mitigate against them. And we have worked with academics, with, with uh, one of the leading um, uh, universities uh, in uh, the state of Qatar to develop and issue guidelines, security guidelines, to, to uh, provide recommendations and to uh, explore the security aspects associated with IPv6. Uh, COVID-19 had also many challenges, uh, uh, had made us face many challenges. Social distancing uh, priorities has changed throughout the industries in terms of uh, securing a robust ICT infrastructure for remote uh, communications and ensuring the work in the, uh, continuity. Uh, we have, uh, as I think uh, Mr. Bilal Jamusi has mentioned, uh, COVID-19 has showed us the importance of uh, IPv6 more than ever, uh, ensuring that we have a robust system for for uh, all types of communication services, solutions is uh, a necessity to advance towards digital transformation. And um, therefore, uh, we have uh, uh, tried to uh, conduct all our regular meetings remotely and provide uh, the, supportive, the support the uh, support our stakeholders needed throughout this process. So just uh, to uh, recap, the lesson learned, the key important aspects of, uh, uh, of uh, this uh, journey was setting a clear goal, a national clear goal by providing a clear strategy, including the action terms and the plans required to transit uh, for a smooth transition of IPv6 across the nation was something very important. Then uh, clearing out the roles and responsibilities and the mission for this process throughout the mission of this process was also one of the uh, key requirement uh, to ensure uh, the success or to achieve the goals uh, provided. We have also um, uh, worked on pr uh, providing plans. The planning uh, activity was not just at the beginning of the process, it was throughout the process, because it's, as I said, it was a, a learning uh, by doing process. We needed to, to tweak our plans and uh, agenda based on the progress made by the, e the ICT ecosystem in, in, uh, as a whole. Providing the support through technical and not technical support, uh, coordinating and collaborating, providing IPv6 test labs in coordination with, by collaborating with key stakeholders was something very uh, essential. Providing uh, technical guidelines for uh, the implementation of IPv6 and the vulnerabilities of IPv6 was also a key requirement. Uh, in addition, providing technical trainings to the ICT implementers was also one of the ways we provided the support and it was key in this process. Overcoming challenges by providing smart uh, measurable solutions addressing the challenges encountered was, was one of the things that we uh, have always been doing and we're doing up to now, uh, trying to overcome any challenges we face by addressing these challenges, investigating them and, and, uh, and uh, providing solutions to do that. Let's not forget motivation throughout this journey. Uh, journey. Smart, um, excuse me, uh, the encouragement and the promotion of IPv6 is something that is essential. Uh, every day through how, uh, throughout the implementation, letting the, uh, the, the people see or the users see the benefit uh, along with the, with the transition and, the, and always uh, clarifying the goal for this transition to everyone. Finally, a continuous uh, test bits, trials, and pilot projects is essential to meet uh, to achieve success. Um, 
I would uh, I wouldn't lie. Uh, there has been some drawbacks, but to move forward, we needed to uh, get ourselves comfortable throughout this journey as as a whole ecosystem and uh, try to conduct as much trials as possible with the service providers uh, and academia to uh, ensure that uh, any uh, obstacles are met by addressing them, uh, taking the required uh, expertise uh, in order to uh, reach success. Uh, this is an ongoing uh, process, so I wouldn't say that you would do one thing for one time. You should always go back and see uh, what you need and uh, what you require to achieve um, the, require, uh, the, the objective of uh, the transition. Thank you for your time. I hope that you have enjoyed uh, this presentation. I'll be looking forward for any inquiries and questions uh, you have at the end of uh, this webinar. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Salma. Uh, if you exit your last slide, yes, please. Uh, thank you, Salma, for all the information you, you heard. And now it's, uh, let's move to our next speaker about a digital regulator is accelerating the growth of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia digital transformation by Adib Lebrady, General Manager for Internet Service Deployment, CIDC. Adib, it's yours now. Thank you, Tony. It is a pleasure to be with you today in this very important uh, webinar. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adib El Brady. I work for uh, CITC, the telecom and uh, IT regulator in Saudi Arabia. Uh, my team and I are looking after uh, internet services development uh, at a national level, and one of our focus areas is the IPv6 uh, uh, adoption. Uh, in today's presentation, I would like to touch on uh, the role of IPv6 in the digital transformation, and also uh, will share some of the experiences and milestones uh, 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 implemented in Saudi Arabia for uh, IPv6 adoption. Then we'll conclude with current status and uh, the way forward as of now. Uh, in fact, the, the role of IPv6 and the importance of it has been nicely addressed in this uh, presentation, in this uh, webinar by the previous uh, presenters. So I, do, I don't want to spend much, much of your time on it. However, I just wanted to emphasize on the fact that CITC as the uh, telecom and IT, and IT regulator is having a very major role in digitizing different sectors in the country. And that's why we support uh, investment in the network, and also we uh, support the adoption of emerging technologies. And one of them is IBP6. IBP6 in particular is very important uh, because it will keep uh, our users and our things stay connected. And we wanted really to use, um, um, uh, um, we wanted to use uh, um, the right tools and the list workarounds so that we can pave the way to, ut to utilizing uh, the, the new emerging uh, use cases and also improve the overall user experience at a national uh, level. Moving to uh, the uh, case journey in this uh, regard, uh, it was uh, it, it, it went like um, very much aligned with the, what Mr. Bilal from ITU has recommended as a best practice and also to uh, similar experiences in the country like in, in the region like in Qatar uh, and other regional countries. Uh, so uh, we started very early in Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, CITC uh, uh, set up a national strategy that was back in 2010. And uh, this uh, uh, IPv6 implementation strategy uh, was uh, based on three major objectives. The first one uh, was to prepare for the IPv6 depletion and to ensure business continuity and internet users uh, growth. And the second objective was uh, to have this mediation or transition is very smooth, uh, very smooth and to minimize the risks. And lastly is to uh, raise the awareness at a national uh, level among all uh, stakeholders from the private and, and from the public sectors about the importance of IPv6. Uh, this strategy has emerged. It was not planned, but it organically emerged in different three phases. The first phase 
has been uh, focused on uh, service providers uh, uh, readiness and also on national services readiness. And the, can, and the second phase uh, focused on uh, enterprises and business consumers. And last phase, which we're currently executing, uh, has the major focus on end users and also mobile devices, which is very important uh, to Saudi as a majority of our internet users are connecting to the internet from uh, mobile. Uh, moving on to the different phases, I would like to just highlight uh, some of the key milestones that were uh, uh, implemented uh, uh, during the different phases. Uh, for example, at the beginning, uh, we established uh, a task force for all the interested parties from the community and uh, also uh, from all service providers and uh, key, uh, key in, and key relevant uh, sectors in the country. We have also for awareness purpose launched an IBP6 website and we built a uh, physical IBP6 lab with tunnel broker for early adapters to experiment and uh, uh, enable and test uh, IBP6 uh, enablement. And that first phase have uh, concluded by the uh, readiness of all core network services within, our, within uh, all of our local service providers, and also the readiness of uh, all uh, national services, for example, the .SACCTLD and other national uh, services. Then we uh, moved on to uh, phase one, and in that uh, phase, we have focused on the uh, enablement for enterprises. Uh, and uh, we have executed a very important project with four different entities from the private and, uh, uh, and uh, public sector to enable uh, their IBP6, uh, uh, um, uh, to enable IBP6 on their uh, uh, internet facing uh, services. And that was really very important to stimulate the demand on the country level and also to support service providers in enhancing their offering uh, in the domain of IPv6 to their uh, business consumers. And uh, as an output of those pilot projects, we came up with um, very sophisticated guidelines that is published on the IPv6 website for all interested uh, organizations to make use of while uh, uh, executing their IPv6 uh, implementation. We have also partnered with a very key stakeholder, which is the academic sector during that phase. And we started providing uh, training to students on uh, IBP6 uh, basics and other IBP6 uh, uh, enablement tools. And that was uh, with partnership, um, uh, in partnership with the academic sector and also with, them, with some of the key uh, network manufacturers in, in Saudi who provided all the materials and all the virtual labs for students to learn and try uh, the, the IBP6. Uh, currently, and during this uh, uh, third phase, uh, uh, the CITC with local service providers uh, uh, focused on enabling uh, physics on end users. And that was um, uh, one of the, one of the uh, important aspects was enabling this on fixed internet by upgrading and enabling uh, physics on uh, uh, CBEs uh, for fixed internet, and also uh, enabling uh, physics on mobile devices there have been a uh, um, uh, very good uh, uh, effort in partner between our local service providers and device manufacturers in enabling and supporting P6 on the mobile devices. Uh, during also this current stage, uh, we, uh, we as a regulator, we are setting some soft targets on all service providers and uh, uh, doing uh, frequent progress uh, reporting among the community to ensure that we are uh, progressing in the right direction in this uh, in this enablement. Uh, all of those uh, different phases uh, have been accompanied and still being accompanied with ongoing capacity building. Uh, we conducted multiple training programs and uh, more than 500 participants uh, uh, have participated in those uh, uh, programs, thankfully. And uh, the, uh, most of those programs was in participation with uh, uh, key uh, network manufacturers in Saudi and also with uh, support from RIPE NCC by providing the, the, the training programs and, and materials. And uh, also the, uh, the, the, the implementation uh, was uh, based on a very effective community collaboration. So it is not only the regulator, it's not only the service provider, 
but it is the whole community, the service providers, the manufacturers, and also the, the academic sector, in addition to uh, the uh, standardization organizations and other uh, relevant communities uh, like the RIBE NCC and ITU, in addition to IB Physics uh, Forum. Uh, that was, uh, in summary, uh, our uh, uh, experience in Saudi, which we are still uh, following up and progressing uh, aggressively. Uh, and as we speak uh, today, the current status for IB physics development in Saudi, it's almost 45% uh, of our users are on uh, physics. And uh, as per the major global uh, ranking for IB physics, uh, Saudi Arabia is one of the top nations uh, in this uh, enablement. And if you can see from this, uh, uh, from the bottom uh, abnic figure, the, 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 um, the, the latest uh, spike in IBP6 uh, adoption during the past two years, uh, thanks to the deployment and the effort by our local service providers on deploying this on mobile devices uh, in particular. Uh, what we plan to do during the uh, uh, near future is to continue also the effort in enabling uh, physics on the mobile devices in partnership with our local service providers and also to increase the offering of IB physics local services. CITC is in, is in uh, support and in effort uh, with all private and government entities to uh, support them, enable their uh, front-facing uh, uh, internet services on, on physics and we will also do continue exploring uh, the IP physics initiatives and the development taking place there and also the coming uh, emerging and uh, use cases in this in this uh, domain. Uh, with that I conclude my uh, my presentation and I would like to thank you for your uh, for your attention and I will be happy to answer any questions during the QA uh, session. So back uh, to you, Tony. Thank you, Adib. Really interesting information. And uh, please, uh, for those people who keep sending on the chat, send your question to Q&A. Now we have a lot of questions on the, on the, on the chat. It should be sent to the Q&A, please, okay? Uh, next is our next speaker, Sultan Asab Asabhan, Zen Technology Core General Manager who will tackle the topic of the IPv6 plus gearing the 5G network de development. Uh, Sultan, it's yours, please. Thank you, Tony, and everyone, uh, and all for, for the presenters, uh, for the valuable information and uh, 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 their encouraging and, and uh, uh, enormous uh, contribution uh, in the explaining and uh, emphasizing the, the advantages of IPv6. Uh, this will ease also uh, applying the, the, the same concept in our uh, network, to, uh, I mean, uh, telecom technology. Uh, our, uh, any, our goal in, uh, in this session is uh, to, pro to provide, uh, I mean, uh, to explain uh, the 5G IP, IPv6 with the 5G network development uh, gearing uh, and uh, to reach this, uh, we'll go in the stages that uh, why 5G and uh, to be adopted and what's uh, the advantages of 5G v6 and we'll go through our experience uh, uh, with, uh, with, in, in the network. Uh, we'll take on on this uh, session, uh, this is our agenda, we'll go through the Gulf Region Digital Transformation Initiatives uh, and uh, 5G network deployment in Saudi Arabia. Uh, IPv6 enhancement and uh, 5G combined uh, Zane journey to IPv6 uh, and Zane IPv6 activation and uh, full deployment. Uh, first, we'll start as uh, we all know uh, and heard and seen and uh, feeling the, the trans digital uh, transformation initiatives, plans and implementations in the Gulf region. Uh, where each uh, GCC country has implemented uh, digitalization initiatives uh, in line with their national uh, vision aiming to diversify their local economy. Uh, for example, in the region, or in our region, uh, UAE has uh, launched several projects for its uh, vision 2030. Qatar has uh, similar initiatives, uh, just like what I explained by uh, Sister Salma 
and uh, clarify the whole uh, the this initiative aspects. Uh, in Kuwait, also we can see uh, that they uh, started also their vision of 2035, uh, or what's been called as New Kuwait. Uh, Bahrain and Oman also has recognized uh, the importance of uh, digital technology and uh, initiated the digital uh, transformation initiatives uh, that fulfill their future requirement. Uh, and the largest strategy uh, in the GCC region uh, is uh, in Saudi Arabia, where digital transformation is, is a key pillar of Saudi Arabia vision uh, 2030, uh, focusing on uh, to deploy uh, uh, and maintain a robust digital infrastructure, uh, accelerating uh, the digital transformation. Uh, this, uh, this structure has enabled the kingdom uh, to face uh, public and private sector uh, disruptions uh, crises, uh, ensuring the business continuity, education, uh, operation, uh, citizen requirement, and uh, daily lives, which were uh, uh, took, took the, the kingdom uh, to uh, rank among the top 10 developed uh, countries globally for its uh, robust digital uh, framework facing the current pandemic. Uh, in our early stages, and Back in 2019, uh, where uh, MCIT in cooperating with CITC uh, and partnering with all the telecom operators in Saudi, uh, they put all the effort uh, toward the commercial launch of the fifth generation network uh, and enabling it, uh, its deployment. Uh, it's, consist, uh, it's, it's, it's considered uh, as uh, the largest 5G network deployment uh, compared uh, with Europe, Africa, and, uh, Middle, and the Middle East, uh, with a coverage uh, of more than uh, 30 cities and uh, more than 5K, uh, 5G towers installed by end of 20, uh, 2019. Uh, all that was uh, seeking to provide uh, a digital infrastructure across all uh, state sector, including industrial sector to uh, enable digital transformation. Uh, today's AIM uh, network uh, is, is covering uh, 50 uh, cities in, in uh, 43 provinces uh, as one of the kingdom largest uh, launches uh, committed for more enhancement and supporting Saudi vision uh, and building a dependable infrastructure uh, for the kingdom. Uh, Five IPv6 uh, enhanced uh, combined with 5G uh, networks uh, uh, 5G networks has uh, any, uh, guarantees high wireless access experience, uh, but uh, emerging it with IPv6 uh, will ensure uh, and guarantee end-to-end -end, uh, service experience. Uh, based on the roadmaps and uh, for the 5G SA uh, and the 5G NSA also, that it could provide a robust ground uh, building base uh, with the required uh, multiple edge uh, cloud-based uh, gateway structure, uh, providing uh, connected uh, devices uh, and faster uh, uh, faster speed uh, for the demand connection. Uh, along with the 5G enhanced uh, features uh, releases uh, embedded with the routing simplification, scalability, and source uh, routing uh, provided by IPv6, enhancement, uh, we can imagine the possibility of, uh, or the, the possible of the solution uh, uh, that can be uh, experienced and, and provided uh, with the 5G microservices. Uh, noticing the various uh, solutions that can be uh, generated by customer demand uh, expected with, and it could be more in, in uh, IPv6 feature adoptions, uh, along with 5G SA bundling features uh, in the current and uh, upcoming telecom releases, uh, covering services uh, such as um, not limited uh, uh, enhanced mo uh, enhanced mobile broadband, uh, ultra ultra reliable low latency communication, massive machine type communication, and uh, enhancing and uh, simplifying the routing for network slicing and providing the VPN pass uh, functions. Uh, all this will uh, enable enormous possibilities uh, and interesting use cases combined with the network simplification that IPv6 enhanced uh, features, uh, eliminating uh, the overhead of LDP, RSVP, 
uh, where uh, IGP protocol uh, used the uh, assigned segments uh, ID uh, to exchange it uh, to all the network layers. Uh, the restoration, the uh, link uh, restoration, quick re restoration, uh, uh, and uh, also leveraging the SDN controller, uh, providing uh, full visibility and a global uh, view of the network data flow. Uh, as uh, as this will allow uh, faster provisioning, uh, faster provisioning. Uh, for the services uh, provided to, to our customers or uh, uh, to uh, our services, uh, exampling, uh, selecting uh, low uh, latency or highest uh, bandwidth uh, links. Uh, we in Tenzin uh, started the uh, journey uh, back in, in 2000, uh, accommodating and uh, and driven by CITC back in 2013 and a bit earlier, uh, sharing experiences as uh, and approaches uh, and uh, best practices, uh, as just mentioned by uh, Brother Adib. Uh, it was a long journey uh, and uh, educational uh, since that uh, stage uh, until uh, the, uh, the point that uh, it was one of Zane's mission and strategies uh, to deploy uh, the targeted protocol and make it a part of its uh, provided solution uh, to the cust to customer uh, 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 to its customer aligned with the telecom network standards. Uh, where in 2015, uh, uh, Zane started the intensive testing and uh, uh, studying and preparing and preparing uh, the option and starting uh, the dual stack uh, transition method. Uh, as part of its um, mobile data solution, taking into consideration the efficiency and customer experience and security aspects. Uh, until 2018, uh, Zane started a major project uh, supported by CITC and uh, guided uh, of verifying and validating all uh, telecom network elements. Uh, to prove the proper functionality on a multi-vendor telecom environment, uh, which uh, itself was uh, a huge challenge uh, on that stage uh, following the updated standards. Uh, with all the testing uh, for interoperability and compatibility with Zane Telecom uh, partners uh, for the targeted solution, uh, the required uh, testing and validation of all network domains, uh, transport, uh, telecom network, uh, core telecom network, including uh, mobile data and signaling, uh, user databases, provisioning services, mediation, uh, charging services, uh, along with uh, wireless access and, uh, uh, and uh, of course, it's uh, ISP. Uh, after this journey of uh, successful uh, verification covering all mentioned uh, domains and uh, various telecom services on mobile devices, uh, Zane started the deployment uh, on the patches, ensuring the KPI and the quality of the services, uh, confirming the service activation uh, to all its connected uh, customers. Uh, by end of two, uh, 2020 and beginning of 2021, uh, all Zane mobile uh, subscribers are provisioned with IPv6, uh, where any customer with the uh, a compatible device uh, are capable to use the IPv6 protocol and have the dual stack enabled uh, function. Uh, now we can see uh, the increase uh, of the IPv6 uh, data traffic in, from Zen mobile network through all the technologies, including 5G. Uh, more than, uh, and we are noticing that more than 50% uh, of our simultaneous uh, users, uh, as assigned, uh, are using uh, signed uh, with IPv6. Uh, in the World IPv6 launch uh, network operator management, uh, Zane ranked uh, uh, before the migration or before deploying the service was uh, around 80 plus uh, prior to the launch. Uh, and after the launch, uh, the rank jumped to 33rd uh, globally after the full customer uh, enablement. Uh, and uh, referring to the APNIC uh, IPv6 measures, uh, measurement, we can notice the increase of traffic uh, as this part of Saudi traffic uh, as shared by uh, Brother Adib. Uh, 
uh, on the ranges of the 50 and the 50s uh, ranges showing the capability of IPv6. Uh, more are expected uh, considering the changes uh, with the customer uh, latest devices. Uh, more adoptions of IPv6, IPv6 with the 5G uh, taking the constellation, the, the, uh, the new solutions and the new visions of a uh, light core uh, 5GSA uh, solution in the market uh, that's starting to pop up now. Uh, it will facilitate uh, and, uh, and the vision of, of utilizing 5G network and uh, giving uh, I mean, uh, uh, a best adoption and giving uh, an adoption that uh, can increase uh, the utilization and, and taking the advantage of IPv6 uh, uh, in the 5G network. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll see more uh, standardization alignment in our in between uh, I mean, telecom standardization and uh, adapting this IPv6 uh, enhancements uh, in future and uh, looking for uh, future deployment uh, and uh, with such a solution and taking on this benefits. Uh, thank you all for your time and uh, back to you, Tony and Angelat. Thank you very much, Tom. Appreciate it. Uh, now we'll go to our, uh, if you remove your slide, please. Stop screen sharing. Yes, thank you, Sultan. Now we'll go to our next speaker uh, about accelerating value generation through innovation, digestion by Damal Sayyum, Vice President Enterprise, Architecture and Transformation of Salat. Jamal, it's yours, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I, I just to check to see if everyone can see the slides. Yes, it's working well. Great. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, Tony, and thanks to all the panelists, uh, certainly for uh, very, very informative uh, keynotes and uh, presentations. Um, uh, today, uh, in fact, I will uh, summarize where we are today from a Tisalat perspective on the IBV6 adoption, um, OUE in general as well. But I will bring a different perspective uh, from the IT uh, from the IT side. Uh, I think we covered a lot on the IBV6 uh, importance. Uh, we covered a lot on the IBV, IBV6 technology itself, uh, and of course the comprehensive programs that have been covered by my colleagues. I will uh, really uh, summarize quickly over what we're doing in Etis a lot, but then I would like to really take it one level a bit higher uh, from the IT perspective, how we are enabling our business uh, and also our customers to really uh, uh, accelerate uh, the business value uh, from uh, technology uh, that are enabled by IBV6 and beyond. So just to quickly, um, uh, just maybe to recap quickly from the IBV6 adoption from within the Tisalat uh, uh, side, uh, we've actually started a program a number of years back uh, to drive the IBV6 adoption. Um, this is a collaborative effort between technology, IT, security, putting all the guidelines, uh, establishing uh, labs uh, to really drive the IBG, IBV6 adoption internally. And uh, over uh, the last few years uh, or last uh, uh, recent years, uh, we've made uh, significant uh, uh, progress or significant moving forward into the adoption. And uh, proudly today, uh, with all of the efforts exerted by uh, the, the task force and the teams, uh, today UE is ranked number uh, 17 on the Akamai adoption list. Uh, uh, adoption of UE is about 40% uh, as per Google. Um, from a Salat perspective, uh, our IP networks are IBV6 enabled uh, with 45, almost 45% uh, of Salat specific traffic is on IBV6. And uh, a lot of our core uh, network services are IBV6 enabled. Uh, today we deploy CPEs on dual stack, uh, preference, uh, bit, whether it's on the consumer or on the business side, uh, uh, based on the preference of the customer, we enable the IBV6 accordingly. Uh, so we're, we're really very committed. And uh, I think our colleagues have highlighted the key importance of the, or the key prerequisite uh, uh, of uh, IBV6 to enable uh, uh, expansion of 
uh, developing in new use cases and developing in new solutions. And that's why I really wanted to really hover one uh, uh, level higher from the IT perspective, how we're working today um, to enable our business, uh, our, our basically our segments, our customers to really leverage on uh, new use cases and new solutions that are certainly uh, will be enabled and continuously to be enabled by the IBV6. So I will not really talk about the technology itself, but I'll hover more on the uh, enablement from the IT uh, perspective. Now, clearly, uh, I think um, as the, co or the colleagues have mentioned, the uh, expansion on uh, the various platforms, whether uh, really uh, the standalone 5G and 5G slicing, uh, taking it also to extending the IoT uh, value proposition, um, and uh, of course, uh, capitalizing on cloud, cloud computing, virtualization, integrating with AI, machine learning. This all has really developed uh, a huge opportunity to really develop much, much smarter services uh, to serve our customers, first of all, and, and, mo and most of all, to serve our customers better, uh, to really customize and develop solutions that are uh, tailored for customer needs. Uh, it's not anymore uh, one size fit all. Uh, we really uh, had to work very hard uh, to tailor uh, solutions that can actually fit our customer needs specifically. Uh, with the with a very dynamic, uh, specifically with the very dynamic nature of, of the business changing, as we can see. Um, so it, this is uh, to enable this such uh, uh, agility in delivering uh, this value to our customers and capitalizing on the, uh, as I mentioned, the new technologies or the emerging technologies of developing new uh, use cases. It was from an IT perspective, it was really, uh, yeah, it was uh, essential for us uh, to really have a very well optimized end-to-end uh, -end architecture. And I'm not gonna go into the detail of the architecture, of course, but this is uh, a pretty much a, a TAM standard uh, architecture, but it is the key point is having a, a standardized, industrialized, uh, uh, simplified architecture uh, between uh, all of the different, of course, uh, uh, components within the architecture and between IT and uh, technology to really streamline uh, the delivery uh, of uh, such uh, uh, smart customized services that all of course would be enabled by the IBV6. Especially now today we're looking at, you know, massive connectivity, uh, massive number of nodes connected to the internet. Um, and certainly uh, IBV6 will be a core uh, prerequisite for having uh, or reaching to this level of connectivity across. Uh, now, our IT role is how to really work closely uh, with uh, technology, our partners, our platform providers, uh, and then, of course, our business to really develop a very well-structured uh, roadmaps on how to really accelerate this value and to put really the, the, the value of such uh, technology to in, in, in the hands of our customers. So, uh, it clearly, uh, it, you know, we've driven uh, uh, a number of uh, transformational projects within uh, it is a lot, uh, specifically on the IT front, also uh, partnering or integrating with the with our technology team uh, to really streamline our channels. It was very imperative for us to really uh, simplify and uh, uh, and really streamline our channels, whether, whether it's a digital on a digital front or on the uh, on a physical front by unifying our digital channels uh, uh, backend uh, with a more simplified uh, uh, backend integration with uh, all the core BSS OSS uh, systems being uh, the catalog management, the order management, fulfillment, activation, uh, revenue management, all across the different uh, backend system. It was really key to really have this uh, standardized, industrialized, uh, components uh, making up the full end-to-end -end stack within uh, IT landscape, but also integrating with all of the services uh, and the, the platforms uh, from the uh, network side. And again, all uh, to really uh, uh, accelerate uh, and provide ways to innovate uh, to how to really capitalize on uh, uh, the, the ca develop and the deliver and capitalize on uh, the new use cases that are made possible today. Um, uh, uh, e either via the 5G as we're working on developing those use cases, but also certainly on the IoT and the AI and the big data integration that we're, um, we're working to provide these such a smart services. So uh, now from the IT perspective, um, 
you know, traditional ways of delivering such services, uh, whether we uh, follow uh, agile approach or a scrum uh, a sprint approach or waterfall approach. And I think a lot of you are familiar with this. Um, it, of course, it was really made possible uh, to really accelerate on the on this on delivering such solutions and such services to our customers uh, by optimizing uh, the, the the architecture itself, as I mentioned, and really streamline this end-to-end uh, -end delivery. However, uh, traditional delivery um, uh, th that basically IT drives in terms of delivering products and services uh, was not really fast enough. Uh, still, uh, it would require time to take requirements. If I go really uh, just uh, highlight if I'd go through uh, maybe the cycle of delivering, uh, whether I deliver through a waterfall approach or I deliver through uh, a scrum uh, 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 sprint approach, uh, the delivery uh, still would require time to deliver uh, the end-to-end -end services. And uh, it was a key for us to really uh, enable much, much faster delivery uh, to our customers and have a much more uh, let's say smarter services that are bundled that tailored for customer needs uh, 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 driven by of course the efficiency of the architecture so moving from the traditional way of delivering uh, such uh, value to our customers uh, it was imperative really to deliver something beyond uh, so we uh, actually de de developed uh, a frameworks that would enable uh, the business to uh, deliver uh, products and services directly uh, to, to our customers without having to really come through the normal classical IT delivery uh, 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 cycle. And this is by uh, simply uh, developing uh, capabilities and components. Uh, uh, and these are all uh, service components that have um, been uh, leveraged and uh, uh, adopted from the different technologies, uh, being IoT, being uh, uh, really on, on different platforms in general that actually embedded within these frameworks. And it really provides the power for our business to really bundle and create different uh, products and services, and also provide a capability to customers to really uh, tailor uh, their products and services to fit their needs and all to actually propagate uh, uh, all of the fulfillment on all of the normal delivery of such services uh, to the IT stack automatically without the IT intervention. So this really provided uh, a shortcut uh, simply uh, by really having uh, requirements, uh, normal business requirements that would come through the traditional way or to, through the get delivered through the traditional way to really jump uh, directly from requirement to launching and deploying and uh, really uh, expediting that leverage uh, uh, from the customer perspective. So, you know, this, this uh, developed a much faster way uh, to really adopt uh, new technologies adopt new uh, use cases and really embed the power of really adopting uh, such uh, technologies into the business hands and into the customer hands to really start uh, tailoring uh, the whatever fit for the purpose solutions that they would need to do their business more effectively and more efficiently. Um, and certainly this, this provided uh, a capability to really deploy uh, MVPs, uh, deploy uh, uh, really uh, A-B testing, uh, uh, accelerate, explore options, uh, and also give the customers diff different uh, uh, flavors and different, uh, let's say, capabilities to really uh, pick and choose. Um, so I'm not going to really go into the uh, uh, detail, but the whole uh, point of the of the delivery. But the whole point here is really uh, how how we are able to uh, leverage on automation and really innovation based on a very well uh, structured architecture between IT engineering and technology to really drive this automation of adopting new platforms and really automatically uh, give that capability to business to structure uh, products and services and use cases without having to go through the classical way of, of delivering uh, products and services. So. Uh, really, as an outcome, uh, today uh, we are uh, really able to deliver uh, consistently across uh, the different channels, whether digital channels or physical channels, 
uh, by this by by adopting this unification across, um, uh, we've actually been able to enable uh, intelligent uh, customer care and really infuse uh, AI into our intelli uh, into our uh, uh, contact center in, in, in to support our customers. Uh, really leverage on RPA and robotics to drive a lot of the back-end processes uh, and uh, uh, really accelerate uh, uh, the, the delivery of customer care and resolving issues and so forth. And of course, this enabled us to really deploy uh, a fully digitized uh, uh, digital uh, uh, retail uh, channel, uh, which we are in, in the process of actually completing as we speak. Uh, really by unifying uh, the digital and physical experience uh, within the retail channel. Uh, all made possible really by having uh, a very well uh, optimized, uh, very well uh, uh, structured uh, uh, architecture between IT technology uh, and all driven based on uh, really well-defined guidelines, uh, well-defined uh, 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 integration points between the two architectures. And the point here is really to say, okay, with the uh, uh, development of uh, uh, new use cases uh, that would definitely drive uh, massive connectivity, mass massive node connectivity to internet, to uh, other services, uh, which will be key uh, enable with uh, which IBV6 will be key enabler to enable that. Uh, from the IT, it's it's as I mentioned, it has uh, been uh, really uh, important for us on how to really take. Uh, the, this opportunity and to take the advantage of such uh, 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 platforms and put it right in the hands of our customers in the quickest way possible without having to go through the traditional way of, of, of really delivering such services and, and really give the power to our customers to customize and tailor uh, solutions that would fit their needs uh, in, the most, uh, 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 in the most effective way. Um, so, uh, of course, uh, with the time limited here, in summary, uh, uh, from an IBV6 perspective, it is a lot is extremely committed, of course, uh, we've, we've, as I mentioned, we've, uh, we've structured a program and that's going to continue to proceed forward uh, uh, across uh, technology, IT and security to uh, uh, continue on the adoption. Uh, we're definitely looking at uh, uh, development of additional uh, or the applicable use cases uh, that we see in different uh, verticals, uh, being on the government, uh, the logistics, uh, education, healthcare, uh, and all uh, will be powered by having this uh, automation and having this uh, optimized architecture really to leverage uh, uh, or enable our customers to leverage uh, uh, on these platforms in, in the quickest way uh, possible. Uh, this actually brings me to the end of the presentation. Uh, the, the, the point uh, that I was trying to make here is beyond, of course, the IBV6, uh, how to really uh, work very closely uh, with the IT, uh, engineering and IT, of course, working closely with our customers to really enable uh, the benefit uh, that IBV6 certainly will enable. Uh, by uh, enabling the, 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 the massive connectivity of the applicable use cases into the future. Uh, I would like to thank, uh, of course, uh, the panelists and uh, I would like to thank Tony and the team uh, for this opportunity and I'll be on standby for any questions uh, from, uh, from the- Thank you, thank you, Jamal. Thank you, appreciate it. Jamal will be with us for the, uh, now before I uh, go for our next speaker, just with using this, we will launch the poll because after the last speaker, we will do the, uh, the Q&A because we have quite good questions now and a lot of questions. Uh, so now, uh, Jamal, please, can you exit the close your screen? Stop sharing screen, Jamal, please. Thank you, thank you, Jamal, again. Okay, now, last but not least, uh, our uh, presenter now is Mr. Latif Ladid, founder and president of IP, IPv6 Forum and chair of ETSI ICG. Uh, we'll give presentation on accelerating the IPv6 innovation and crossing, crossing the digital divide. So Latif, it's yours now, please go ahead.
Thank you, uh, Tony and team, uh, for inviting me to this uh, very strategic uh, event and um, uh, by getting some very good speakers from, especially from the Gulf, uh, showing us the one of the best examples how to deploy, promote, deploy, and uh, possibly mandate IPv6 in the region. And this is very, very strategic um, work. Uh, especially that we have been doing the marathon for the last two decades in order to get to this level, especially in the Gulf uh, region. And I'm very pleased to have one uh, Huawei to work with us for the last sprint to IPv6 by 2025. And I'll let go through a bit of uh, um, a bit of data that we have gone through um, so, so, so basically what we have done so far is uh, that we have now an address space in order to address the future. Okay, so, so it's really to address the future internet in a large scale. Uh, and for that, we don't need to have any more IPv4 uh, and no more NAT. So basically we are moving to IPv6 only. And this is really fundamental because it has many consequences. Uh, the first one is that we can cut the CAPEX and OPEX in the future. Uh, so we will not be running you know, dual nets as we have today, V4 net and uh, IPv6, especially CG net. So we'll return to the end-to-end -end control. Although uh, when you get an IPv6 address on your PC, the operating system creates two IPv6 addresses. One is the privacy address, and the other one is the globally routable address. The privacy address is used to uh, surf on the internet, so nobody can find a trace of your visits on the internet. This is fundamental. So the only thing you need is basically an IPv6 firewall, which you need anyway in uh, IPv4. And some people, as one of the question was, you know, since we don't have NAT, we don't have any security. This is wrong. NAT is not a security box, and it does not give you any privacy at all. So, so you need to have firewall in order to do that. And then uh, what Robin has been discussing is this new end-to-end -end, uh, service will open a chain of the very innovative applications, or let's say in this case, protocols like segment routing and multicast uh, approaches that are not yet uh, doable to today in the internet. So the goal is by 2025 that we will see the first IPv6 only internet as we see it now today with some 5G using standalone as well, like in the case in, in, in the US with T-Mobile. <clears throat> so, so basically anyone that has NAT today, and unfortunately uh, all of us are uh, using NAT when using IPv4. So we are all of us in the uh, luggage class so only the servers are using routable IP4 addresses. And those that have IPv6 today, they're basically already in business class without knowing it. And I will show you some of the numbers, how many people this. So it's with IPv6 only and adding to it 5G, cloud computing, internet of things, then we'll get into the era of first class. And this will happen in the next five years. So if we do this sprint properly and all together, so if we look at the uh, uh, penetration worldwide, so from uh, Google and uh, Akamai numbers, we are at 36%, but they don't include the Chinese uh, numbers, which are quite massive, 435 million. So if you put them together, we are already at 44.7%, which is almost half of the world is using IPv6 without knowing it. And this is really very good news because it will enable us to take the last sprint to IPv6 only. So in terms of the propagation, uh, as uh, many of the speakers have mentioned that the Gulf has been doing very well in promoting uh, V6, especially in Saudi Arabia and, and the United Arab Emirates, but as well as in Qatar, uh, Kuwait, uh, Bahrain, and Oman. And I think the, the uh, uh, Gulf Council should really get together in order to promote exactly what the speakers uh, from Selma and from, uh, uh, from our friend uh, from Saudi Arabia have been uh, promoting. So this is very important. So in terms of the V6 deployments, so China is the number one and India number two. So 
really the internet in the future is going to happen in Asia by large, just due to the fact of the population, but also to the number of 5G connectivity as today, China has 200 million 5G connections uh, uh, among the 250 million worldwide. So only 50 million 5G deployments are done outside of China. So, so anything is going to happen in the future is going to happen in China. So it would be a very good place to learn the new lessons. We, we started the first IPv6 task force in, uh, in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the Crown Prince at that time, Al, Al Maktoum, he opened the conference and we had about 600 people there. So you can see him and gave him an award uh, uh, in supporting us of this. And later on, uh, together with Iti Salat, we have done many events together. So I'm glad that Iti Salat has taken strong role in the last uh, couple of years in order to get to, to IPv6. So. so we have something like 90 IPv6 councils and task forces around the world. You know, even some people have forgotten that they had one. Uh, many of them are active, but uh, only a few guys in some of the places like uh, Africa and so on. So the event that you are doing today would be excellent in some remote places like Africa and also some Southeast East Asian uh, territories where IPv6 is not highly deployed. So in terms of uh, V6 only deployments, so the US government has already put a plan together. So by 2025, they would like to have 80% of the US government networks to be deployed on IPv6. And the same thing had been also announced by uh, China last week and ought to do it in steps that will do by 2023 IPv6 in a certain number of places. And, and they should for total uh, removal of IPv4 by 2030. So it coincides with the uh, proposals that have been done by the other countries. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't put you know, Qatar and Saudi Arabia in the UAE in this space. So this is more of a kind of, uh, you know, a couple of the countries that mentioned over there. So, so what is the impact of IPv6 on IoT? It's basically to move to two-way things to things. We should not mess around with, uh, with things. It should work for us. You know, they are our next, uh, let's say, digital uh, uh, slaves, if you, if you want. And they should do the work for us. We should not get, uh, get, uh, get involved in this one. So as of late, uh, 3GPP has announced that IPv6 should be for IoT. That was already back in 2019. Uh, through Adrian Cray's uh, CTU of Etsy uh, here in the UK, but also one of the uh, prime co-founders uh, of 3G, and I'll get back to this one. And the impact on cloud computing is also very important. So currently we are uh, run by 80% through AWS, which is a proprietary protocol. So we'd like to push this to an open stack, and as of late, the European Commission is putting together what is called Gaia X. Gaia in, in Greek means Earth. So earth for everyone and the X is there. In order to have data sovereignty across Europe, and this should be also a model for the rest of the world to have your own data to be sovereign in your own country. And nothing should be put on the database uh, or at least the backup of your data to be somewhere in the US because there you have the Cloud Act, which allows NSA you know, to look at, at your data. So it's fundamental to do this task as well as the next one. So for the wireless world, it's only in 3G, when basically at that time, 3GPP wanted to use as protocol the web uh, protocol, which is the, the wireless access protocol. And I had the chance uh, to talk to them and basically convince them that they should not use web, but they should use IPv6, which was accepted through a, a standard back in, uh, uh, in May 10th, uh, two, 2000, yeah, so IPv6 was uh, planned for 3G, but then the deployment did not happen because we lacked capacity building and products and so on and so forth. So, so they preferred to use IPv4 and then NAT uh, later on, but that created basically the wireless internet. So if we didn't do that at that time, most probably today, 3G, 4G, there would be a rather telecom only uh, type of uh, things using IMS which have been uh, most probably a very bad decision at the time. But at that time, nobody believed in the internet. So we could show them that uh, IPv6 down the road would solve all their problems. And in the meantime, you know, we have 5G with NSA and SA 
So the move to SA is now booming quite a bit around the world. Uh, for, the, for the simple reason that you don't need to keep 3G, 4G, and 5G on your networks. You know, that's a temporary solution. So you have to move to 5G, uh, SA, uh, because it has a worse IP, IPv6 in this case embedded, which was not the case for 4G. So you have to keep 3G out to do voice on, on it. And then uh, 6G will not replace 5G because uh, the spectrum used in 6G is terahertz. And terahertz has uh, certain deficiencies one is that terahertz can have only 10 meters of, the, of length. They cannot cross windows and walls and so on. And if it rains outside, the communication drops as well. But it has a high throughput, in this case, uh, things like terabit. So you can use it indoor in manufacturing or in large assembly uh, city uh, uh, places where you can change uh, quickly, let's say the assembly line into something new. So, so you don't need to have uh, fiber optic cables to do that. So you'll get into some kind of deeper vertical to be complementing uh, 5G, okay? And I'll get to blockchain. So blockchain basically is a peer-to-peer -peer application. And for the time being, it has been used uh, based on BitTorrent and it is currently run on IPv4. Since it is a peer-to-peer, end-to-end routable, uh, a secure function, it has to have routable IP for addresses. Since we are running out, we have run out of IP for the rest. In this case, we have to move to IPv6 in order to give it the larger scale. So currently, you have more kind of a, uh, kind of a, uh, digital coins like like Bitcoin and so on. There are about one thousand seven hundred of them. They're primarily, uh, I would call them, uh, you know, speculation currency. So it's not an investment. So it's not backed up by anything. But you can use blockchain for things like. Uh, you know, contracts, uh, which is now used quite quite widely. And down the road, if we fix the digital keys because they have been hacked many times, then you can use it for smart cities and IoT and so on. And then together with IPv6 and then it's fundamental. But uh, we have to look at rather the new protocol designed by NIST in the US called Data Block Matrix, where you can erase the data, especially your privacy data, so, you, so that nobody can track you know, who are you and so on and so forth. So privacy in Europe is very important due to GDPR. So, so this data block matrix, and I, I would like you to look into it, and you can download the software in order to use that. It's going to be fundamental. So in the meantime, and this is the reason why we have this event, is that we have this uh, Etsy IPv6 enhancing relation. And we have in the meantime about 60 uh, partners, you know, working uh, to join it. And here we define many of the things that Robin has been talking about, you know, to get you some best practices and practice guides uh, from uh, telecom operators. So join us you know, to, to participate in this. And we have a webinar uh, for, organized by Etsy itself on September 13th, where most of the work done in this uh, ISG is going to be uh, proposed. So, so down the road, this is how we're gonna work out. So, so the government, so the US government is going to do IPv6 only by 80% of the network. The Chinese government has launched last week its plan uh, in steps or in certain phases. Already by 2023, most of the ISP should support IPv6. And obviously by, uh, by 2030, IPv6 will be only working. So we'll divorce IPv4 from the, let's say. So we see this thing happening also in, in Germany and so on. In terms of ISPs, we expect by the top 100 uh, 5G uh, operators or MNOs will be doing SA. And in terms of web access, so the top 1,000 uh, websites that create 80% of the uh, traffic do basic will be doing IPv6 only. As of today, we have only about 250. And then in terms of cloud, so basically uh, cloud is going to be very important for the SMEs, for the small companies that do not have the uh, technology and the knowledge in order to do that. So they will get IPv6 done uh, automatically for them and for free through the cloud services. So that's why you know, things like Amazon and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, Chinese uh, cloud companies are, are moving to this thing. And then we'll go back to the peer-to-peer -peer applications like blockchain conferences like this one. But we will have a digital divide. 
So we have about 25% that will be doing IPv6 only by 2025. 50% will be doing dual, so v4, v6, and 25% uh, will be doing still IPv4, but that's fine because the majority will be taken care of anyway by the top guys because they will be giving them IPv6 automatically. So, so we need that sprint to IPv6 only, you know, to make the internet simple, direct, end-to-end, -end, you know, all-inclusive, you know, transparent. And I think that's an excellent mandate that we should have on us, at least on a voluntary basis. So, so last word from the inventor of the internet, and he's the honorary chairman of the IPv6 forum. You know, he is asking you uh, kindly to move to IPv6. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Latif. Okay, if you can just stop screening. Then we're very excited for the all information today. Uh, now I will uh, just I will stop the polling and we'll go to the Q and A. The result of the polling will be will launch at the end of the session. Let's start with the because we have a lot of question now. I'll start with Rahul Kishore. Major industry missing in IPv6 adoption, adoption, adaptation is a e gaming. Do we have any strategy to motivate them? Uh, please, he didn't say to which, uh, which mm -hmm. one. Who will take this question, please? Uh, I'll, I'll go quickly with it. Uh, so yeah, gaming is, uh, is, is latency. Uh, you know, it's like banking. The banking with Swift, uh, they use that because you know, every second is worth billions of dollars. And in the gaming, the same thing as well. So it needs, it needs like the function that we have in the 5G, this URL C, so, so ultra reliable thing. When you have it across the world, you have to have end-to-end -end connectivity. So gaming would benefit a lot from, uh, from IPv6. So, so now it's up to the gaming industry you know, to look into this and do that. So that's another, another topic. Oh, thank you. Now, question from Muhammad Osama. Do we need firewalls after the deployment of IPv6 and IPv6 plus? Who will take the answer for this, please? I think I have addressed this uh, uh, a bit. In, in your presentation. Yes, so quickly. Uh, so, so basically, this is a fallacy that NAT gives you security and privacy. This is totally wrong. So it's rather the firewall that gives you security. And uh, in IPv4, it's more the MAC address, which is detected because the MAC address is a serial number of your LAN card, which, the, which decides on which laptop you are on in which network. So in IPv6, we have addressed this issue by creating automatically through the operating system two IPv6 addresses. One is called privacy IPv6 address, and one is routable. So the routable has the MAC address in the suffix. And in the privacy address, we randomize the suffix in this case that when you connect to the internet, you use only the privacy address in order to go to the internet. So nobody can find your, your MAC address. So in this case, we have a privacy protocol for IPv6 while there is none in IPv4. But you still need the firewall. So a v4 firewall and a v6 firewall if you are dual stack. Thank you. Now we'll go to the other question from LV Correos to Adib Libredi, uh, CITC. The IPv6 journey in Saudi Arabia and globally looks promising. However, the mass pool of addresses make it more complicated and challenging to detect threats. How can more sophisticated cybersecurity issue to be addressed? Was this innovation? Adi, please. Yes, um, agreed. Cybersecurity challenges are uh, uh, always there, either in P4 or, or in on P6. And um, I think our local service providers are handling this uh, very well. It is a challenge, but it is by doing the uh, the capacity building and the training on, on, on physics and also by ensuring the, the upgrade uh, of the uh, latest ha hardware and uh, um, IT systems to the latest versions to ensure that there are no uh, like uh, vulnerabilities due to, uh, due, due to physics. But it is a challenge and I think it is uh, uh, similar for both P4 and uh, physics. Thank you, Adi. Uh, 
some requests for sharing presentation. Uh, you have to contact us uh, later uh, to check because uh, some speaker doesn't like to share presentation. This is from Rai Vikra. Uh, another question from Kalat Khan. Adoption of IPv6, do we need BSS stack charging system interface on IPv6 as well? Who so will take Jamal? Can you answer this? Do we need BSS stack charging system interface on IPv6 as well? Um, uh, yeah, sure. I will take that question. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, you know, IPv6 uh, uh, enabled platform uh, in terms of the BSS stack when it comes to the fulfillment, whether uh, the charging, uh, billing, uh, catalog management, order management, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be itself on IPv6. Uh, it, it will drive, of course, the fulfillment of services that will be enabled by IPv IPv6. Now, uh, of course, it's recommended as an IT uh, platform, as an IT landscape to be on IPv6. I mean, this is where we're driving really the adoption, not only on the public network, but also on the private network, where all of those systems on the BSS stack would be also uh, uh, migrated to IPv6 uh, alongside with the, with the actual platforms. But it's not a prerequisite uh, that you have to have those uh, IPv, IPv6 enabled. Thank you. Uh, there is a question I will address to Salma. What's the percentage of improvement in RTT and latency in IPv6 compared to IPv4? Can you take it, uh, Salma? Salma, are you with us? Uh, yes, Tony, can you please repeat the question? Yes, of course. Uh, what is the percentage of improvement in RTT and latency in IPv6 compared to IPv4. Um, in terms of the latency, we we know that with the with the with the implementation of IPv6, we can open doors for 5G adoption and uh, adopt the 5G adoptions when when it's uh, implemented and uh, uh, promoted across the networks. It increased latency to uh, real time. If uh, if that uh, is what uh, is asked for. Uh, Real-time uh, internet connectivity uh, is uh, enables uh, uh, various types of uh, smart solutions and uh, and services uh, that can be uh, implemented, uh, inshallah, in the future. Thank you very much. And now, question to Robin Lee. Robin, in a multi-vendor scenario, how can application-aware networks powered by IPv6 Plus work effectively considering that more te technological advancement will emerge in the years to come. Mm. Okay, uh, so this I have the two points regarding this uh, the question. Uh, the first one we know that now that's the in the network size, there's a lot of this new innovation work. For example, the SR, uh, SRV6 and also the network slicing. Uh, so chain, uh, so is the chaining, etc. That means there are some more types of the network service. So that if we can convey this the application information to the uh, to the network, so that uh, based on the application informants uh, inform information for different types of the uh, different types of the new network service. So this means that you this the you this the technology can take uh, uh, use of the advantage of this the new technology ad advancement. The second point uh, we know that in the traditional way uh, to implement the integration of the network and the application, we always use the uh, orchestrator and the network controller. But you know that the, between the orchestrator and the network controller and the device, uh, there are all kinds of the uh, interface. So the interoperability is very complex. Okay, thank you, uh, Robin. Anyway, the, the voice is uh, gone. Uh, but anyway, thank you. Okay. We'll go now to question okay. to Samir. Uh, Samir, there is a question for you. Uh, yes. As per Samir Ashwa, IPv6 Plus has segment routing feature. 
Has it been adopted by any service provider in the Middle East? What are the risks and challenges related to it? Yeah, I think this is a good question and uh, I can answer like this first. Yes, in Middle East, uh, I cannot give you the name, but yes, many big tier one operators already adopted SRV6 because they believe that SRV6 is one of the way to uh, realize, I mean, the protocol simplification in the 5G network when SDN is sitting at the top uh, to, to, for the automation and network analysis. Uh, so that's one of the motivation that they are already adopting in Middle East. And, or not, and other than Middle East, all over the world, especially in Japan, South Korea, and Europe, uh, they are strongly, you know, convinced for adopting SRV6 for the for the IPv6. For the challenge point of view, uh, it's a very big question, but I can simply answer that it's not about implementing SRV6 because of IPv6. It's just to strategize the IP strategy first, and then they know that when and where they can implement SRV6 because most of the deployments are the brownfield. So how to get rid of brownfield deployments with uh, MPLS and going to SRV6, that's a big biggest challenge. For the greenfield service providers are not much worried because they're clear it's end-to-end -end IP, native IPv6 from the vendor's point of view. Uh, but from the brownfield, that's the biggest challenge. And then they are actually busy in answering that one. In, in short, it's an answer. Much. Thank you. Uh, now we have answer for both uh, Adib and Sultan. Uh, from Sainchi Pai, IPv6 deployment increased quickly in Saudi Arabia last year. Now Saudi is the top 10 in the world. What's the reason for Saudi Arabia IPv6 deployment leading? So I don't know, we start with Sultan or Adib because both you should answer to this, please. I can start, uh, Adib. Take me a uh, take this allowance. Yeah, Adib. Adib, we start with the regulator. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead, uh, Sultan. Uh, yeah, take it out, yeah. Uh, and as, as we mentioned uh, at, the, in, in, at the presentation also, uh, yeah, it's uh, one part of uh, uh, Saudi vision uh, uh, adopting the, and, uh, I mean, Saudi vision to proceed with uh, the digitalization infrastructure uh, building in the kingdom. And, and uh, it's, it's one of the assets, uh, assets that we need to uh, create in our network and make it ready for all traffic uh, uh, across uh, the limitation that we are facing today with IPv4. IPv4. So IPv6 is uh, opening uh, uh, additional uh, services and functions and, and adaptation to new technologies uh, to uh, I mean, increase uh, the, and facilitate uh, our vision uh, targets. Thank but you, Just to add to what uh, Sultan has just uh, mentioned, uh, the 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 the, um, the latest progress in IPv6 adoption in Saudi was due to mobile um, uh, enablement on P6. Uh, there is a great segment from our users in Saudi uh, accessing the internet from mobile and not from fixed. And that's why when we were able to resolve some of the difficulties and challenges of enabling physics on mobile, we started seeing that uh, uh, aggressive growth on the, on the adoption. Thank you, uh, thank you, Adib. Now we'll go for a question and also another. When we had uh, NAT, the community benefits from an in, indirect in security perimeter as that effectively hit, hit or hide the private IP ranges. In IBP6, how can we provide a cost-effective solution as such for all? Mm -hmm. I guess uh, Latif uh, and Bilal should answer this. Yeah, yeah. Latif, I have already addressed start? this yes. question. It's the same like the previous one. So exactly. The same, answer, <laughs> the same answer applies to this one as well. OK, so already this answer? Yeah. OK. For, uh, uh, it's, uh, there is a question regarding CGNAT role in IPv6. Since we don't need to perform NAT for direct IP is allocated. I guess you already in your presentation. It's Do we need to add firewall? Already this one uh, we answered. Sorry yeah. for from uh, France or Bayer. It just is, was answered also. As a matter of fact, uh, CGNAT is not good. Uh, yeah. In, in Europe, uh, we have. Uh, because you share basically uh, one IP address among 1,000. Uh, in Europe, in some countries, they have limits to 12. 
And we had some cases where <clears throat> some people have been arrested because they were discovered to download, uh, you know, pedophilia uh, stuff in big. And then when they took the guy uh, six o'clock in the morning, they put him in jail. And the same evening, it's the neighbor who is doing that because they are sharing the same IP address. So it's not go very good for society. Huh? Thank you very much. This is another question from Khalad Khan. It's almost the same. Limitation IPv6 and the challenges are faced in IPv6 enabled to any network. Who would like to answer this also? Limitation of IPv6. Well, I think uh, it's a limitation. It's going to, to solve the limitation of IPv6. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I don't know, Samir, if you would like to answer this. Or Bilal. Yeah, uh, Tony, Dr. Bilal, please. Yes, thank you, Tony. Perhaps the limitation is not in the technology itself. The limitation is in perhaps in the lack of uh, capacity, the resources, human resources to embrace and deploy the new technology. Um, so it's not the technology limitation. It's not having enough experts to move in the transition from V4 to V6. And that's where we're putting a lot of emphasis in ITU with our partners to train and enable um, countries to transition from V4 to V6. Thank you, Dr. Bilal. Uh, we have some questions, some repetition or no, but just to tell you that we are over uh, the time by 10 minutes. So just our speaker, I don't know if you have, you can stay with us more so we can read more questions. We have a lot of questions. It's very act interactive. Does this mean you are you did well in your presentation, all of you? So, what basic reservation while implementing the policy making decision for deployment of IPPC technology? Uh, answer is open to anyone, please. Yeah, I can. I can. Basic, this one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Please. Yes. Okay. So basically, you know, we always thought that uh, developing countries, the only. Uh, let's say entity that can, uh, let's say, uh, incentivize and promote new technology is the government because they are the biggest buyer and so on. Now, when you look at, uh, at what's happening in the US and China and so on, it's rather the governments that are taking that, that stage because they use their purchase power you know, to stimulate uh, the move into new technologies, uh, especially in Europe, uh, you know, they use a lot of invest investment in research now to get into new technologies. So, so the government and regulator really play a fundamental role in this kind of thing because it's not a way to get thing. It takes a lot of time. So you need to have some deadlines. So not as strict as the way to get, but you have phases and, and, and then the people will, will do that. But it's uh, obviously down to capacity building, down to uh, you know, use cases, you know, large scale demos in the country openness of the network to cooperate among each other and so on. So, so it's, this is how the internet has functioned at the beginning. And it's not gonna be different, right, in the six. Matter of fact, you need more, because now we have more technology put on top of the, on, on the core uh, internet. Thank you. There is one more question. Uh, promoting IB6 adoption should be part of national digital transformation strategy. What do you think? Anyone can take this, Salma? Uh, as regulator, maybe you can answer this question. Is IPv6 deployment should be part of, uh, of uh, national of course, digital information strategy? Of course, uh, IPv6 promotion is uh, is a necessity. It's a key uh, requirement uh, to ensure uh, uh, that a clear goal for digital transformation is provided for the users and for the industries. I would agree, uh, I would say yes, it's essential. We have conducted similar uh, initiatives, uh, promotion through uh, media platforms, a promotion through publishing of documents and guidelines, promoting in any way possible to encourage the adaptation, especially that we have earlier uh, throughout this uh, webinar, we have mentioned uh, the list of of uh, benefits, advantages, and importance of IPv6 for uh, the uh, digital transformation. Thank you very much. Now, there is a nice question. When IPv4 will completely die? When will arrive? What do you think? Some timeline, uh, due date? No, uh, IPv4 uh, does not have to die because it's highly successful. So the only thing we can do is divorce it or take it out 
So the deadlines have been already set by the US government by 2025. Uh, so the other countries will follow. So if the majority of the traffic is going to be on IPv6, so it would be you know, a, a debt uh, not by, by nature. So I would not uh, promote full debt before. It can work forever. But the majority Thank of the you. traffic would be in IPv6. Thank you. In case of IoT with IPv6, that is a huge chance for security violation. I would like to answer this. Is this true? I guess Robin maybe could answer us this. Robin, do you think there is a security violation uh, in IoT with uh, deploying IPv6? Uh, I think that this IoT is a is an important chance for the uh, for the IPv6. But I think that's the there's also the all kinds of way to uh, cope with the security issues. And also, you know that through the IPv6, we can encode this the uh, encrypt this information. It can also uh, to improve the security. So I don't think this is a conflict. Thank you. Uh, what are the first steps government in the developing country can take to overcome the challenges related to faster IPv6 uh, adoption? Uh, to Mr. Latif or to Bilal, what are the first steps government in developing countries can take to overcome the challenges related to faster IPv6 adoption? Uh, yeah, maybe Tony. I, I think I touched on this in my uh, my remarks. Is that uh, one of the uh, um, best current practice is to certainly have a strategy, national strategy, to do to to deploy IPv6 and roll it out, um, and have a dedicated entity unit in in the government to look after that transition and uh, be the focal point for uh, all the transition aspects of IPv6, uh, IPv4 to IPv6. Um, also do all the capacity building and training. Um, and as uh, Latif mentioned, having national uh, deadlines of when the transition needs to happen and, uh, and the procurement implications would, uh, would certainly put an accelerating factor on that transition. Uh, Thank you. I can reply quickly. We have a wonderful yes. example from Qatar, from Selma and from Adi. So, so these two examples are wonderful to, to take as as a model for the other countries. Okay. Uh, in native IPv6, does we shift management plan also on IPv6 or IP management is a lot easier as compared to IPv6? The shift from IP, IPv4 to IPv6, it doesn't it, it, it need any management uh, plan. I don't know. I think in your presentation, we talk about the about same. So, so there is a difference between native IPv6 and IPv6 only. Native yes. IPv6 can be dual stack, okay? So the same rules you have for IPv4 will, will apply to IPv6. When you do IPv6 only, then you have to go do deep analysis because currently IPv6 relies a bit on IPv4. For many things we don't know. So when we do IPv6, we have to go through all functionalities want to find out exactly that the fallback will have to be IPv6. Today, the fallback is still IPv4. And this is really a big step in the future that the fallback has to go uh, on IPv6. Thank you. Uh, we'll take last question before we go to polling. Uh, seeing the huge benefit of IPv6, in your opinion, what still stands in the way of operators and government to shift to IPv6 that's making the transition slow. How we can overcome on this? I, I think it was addressed by uh, all the speakers. So this is kind of um, you know repeating the attack conference. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. So so. See, uh, you hear me? Okay. Very good. Yeah. So, I don't know. You will take this. Okay. Yeah. So basically, <clears throat> you have pioneers. You have those that wait for the pioneers to mess it up, and you have those that just follow. You know the big guys. So if you are a pioneer, uh, you know. You know, progress is a secret in the future. 
So, so when you are smart, you find the secret of the future and that's called progress. So if you are a pioneer, you will be ahead in many things. So, so your people will be smarter, your products will be smarter and so on and so forth. So, so you are at the top end of the services and the products. That's what makes you rich. You don't get rich with, with the you know, products that are users that nobody wants to buy. Okay. And today- Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, yeah, sure, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I think you're, you're done. No, no, go ahead, continue, please. So, 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 you know, talking about COVID uh, as, as such, you know, it's always like this. You need a catastrophe in order to do something. So it looks like COVID is the killer app for, uh, for the digital transformation. And so if we benefit from COVID, it's not only our health and future health and so on, but also, you know, to get our, te our technologies to be really up to spec, to serve everyone and to connect everyone. Uh, especially in developing countries, because it's their, their only chance to move up. And we can see that with, the, uh, with wireless access in Africa. Without cell phones, you know, they will not be connected at all. So, so you know, we have, to, we have to drive everyone into this direction so that each one has a, a chance. Okay, thank you very much. Now we will not take more questions because already we're 20 minutes over the time. I would like to share the result of the poll, which is really good because we achieved 82% of, uh, of our audience who, who vote on this poll. And it will make really what people are expecting from IBP6. So I'm sharing the result now. I don't know, it's a little bit slow. Uh, it seems, I don't know, the problem, I guess, from Zoom, because it keeps giving any error or sharing results, so I will read it without sharing. I don't know, it's uh, still having a uh, problem with sharing, so I will read first question. And I will start reading. What IT network does your organization company using now? Single choice. 48%, uh, 59%, uh, they said we are using combination of IPv4, IPv6. Only IPv6 is 7%, IPv4 is 34%. So we can I see guess it it's. Uh, we can see you see now. it now. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, so for this, so as we see that uh, this uh, second question, still your company deployed migrate IV6 network recently. We have 73%, they said yes, and no 27%. Uh, question number C, do you agree that in the era of 5G and the cloud, IV6 and IV6 plus will, will develop Rapidly, 96% they agree, which means the trend is going to IBV6, IBV6 plus. So that's all for today. I would like to thank all our speakers, all our participants, because this make really one of the most interactive sessions. We still have a lot of questions not answered, unfortunately, but uh, we cannot do all, all the, we don't have time. We can stay the whole day. So. What I would like from everyone now to say thank you very much. Keep in touch. We will send you all the link for the coverage in Telecom Review by next Tuesday, hopefully. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate Bye. it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 B